right now. Type in um, where you are so I can share with everybody. I know Richard and I are both here, but there's at least six or seven other people out there that are watching us. The main reason I was keeping track, my, my kid, who's now working in Korea, said she was going to try to check in and watch live, but I think she's asleep. It's about 3 a.m. there, so I'll forgive her. She can catch it later, but um, it's an interesting uh, aspect that we've got here. So if you're not able to make it sometime, take advantage. Take advantage. Um, when our pastor called me up a a couple of weeks ago, and asked if I would be willing to, to preach. He said, hey, you can take the 10th or the 17th. And I said, well, what do you need, Pastor? And he says, well, it's up to you. You go ahead. So I said, okay, I'll take the 17th. That'll give me a little more time to get ready, right? And then he says, oh, uh, would you reconsider? <laughs> I didn't know we had a comedian for a pastor. Huh? What's going on? What do you mean, Pastor? He said, well, I really need somebody for the 10th. So, okay, okay, I'll take the 10th. That was back in August. I thought I still had more time. No, two weeks. Oh, my goodness. I've never gotten a sermon ready in two weeks. I like to take about a month. I'm not a pastor. I take my time. I think about it. I work it over, right? And um, boy, so I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'm feeling like I'm the least prepared. I've been for a sermon in a long, long time, but I know I know Brother Aaron and Brother Jose are praying for me, and I know Pastor Zach, Pastor Zach Page, who I borrowed much of this information from, from the Templeton Hills Church. He's been praying uh, for me with me over the last few weeks as we prepare here, so thank you for that. In fact, let's go ahead and have a word of prayer right now. And our God, we just thank you so much for this time here. We ask that you'll make me your, your vessel here, and just uh, you take over. You take over. This is your time. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. So I have a confession. It's not a, it's not a bad confession, but I have a confession to make. I love libraries. Ever since I was very young in Santa Maria, Grandma Kurtz and Mom would take me to the library, and then my brother came along, him too, every week. Every week we would go, and then, then we moved, and Scottsdale, the, the branch library, the main library, eventually the bookmobile. That was a cool experience, going to the bookmobile every week. Um, from there, moved back to Porterville. Gosh, I did go to the Porterville Library during vacations when I was young here, too. Love that big map that used to have in there. Um, but, you know, when I was in you know, junior high, high school, I wasn't necessarily going to the library every week. And then on to La Sierra University, and I think I was in that library every day sometimes. So it's just been a, a long experience for me. And then my kids came around and back to going every week again right here in Porterville. So... Um, I've had a long and, and uh, good relationship with libraries. Thank you, Mom. Thanks for teaching me to love libraries, love books, love reading. It's been a blessing through my life in many, many ways. Thanks. So a few centuries ago, a young man entered a library, and as he walked into the library, he was perusing through the books there, and he looked and he found one that was really old and began to dust it off. Oh, well, there were the libraries I visited as a youngster. Anyway, skipped that one. All right, there we go. Maybe the Bible looks something like this, okay? And he was astonished that he didn't even know that, that the Bible existed. See, he knew that there were Psalms. He had heard of the Gospels. He was educated, so he had done some reading himself, but he had no idea that there was an entire Bible that existed. And his name was Martin Luther. He was studying at the University of Wittenberg, and this is what one writer records that he said. He said, Oh, that God would give me such a book for myself. I want to have that kind of passion for this book. You know, this book has multiplied. You can, you can use your, your phone. You can pull it up in, in different languages, in different translations, so conveniently, so easily. Uh, you can switch back and forth. Um, in fact, a couple years ago, I went through the whole Bible in one year. It's the first time I've done that. But I didn't actually read it. I had the, the um, YouVersion app read it to me. But it was very convenient. If I heard something I wasn't sure about, I could just pause the reading, go and read, switch between different versions, see what it was like, and, and check it out. So there are so many things that we have today. And are we saying that? Do we have that kind of an attitude? Oh, that God would give me such a book for myself. Let's go look. We're going to spend a lot of time in Daniel chapter 8 today. And we're going to start here with verse 1. In the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, a vision appeared to me. To me, Daniel, after the one that appeared to me the first time. So 
Prior to this, we can find the, the four kingdoms in general, in Daniel, in several different places. We can find them in uh, Daniel chapter 2. We can find them again in Daniel chapter 7. But now we're going to find something astonishing. We're going to find that he, Daniel actually names these kingdoms that are going to come. And this is all done a couple hundred, even hundreds of years before these kingdoms actually came to power. So first he sees the ram, but there's something funny about it. It has two horns, and one horn is raised up a little bit bigger than the other. So we learn from historians that actually the Medes were stronger at first, but under Cyrus, the Persians began to gain power. So this gives us the idea of what this ram represents, but we don't just have to guess, because in Daniel chapter 8, verse 20, the angel reveals to Daniel and says, The ram which you saw having the two horns, they are the kings of Media and Persia. So here it tells us that Persia will become great and is able to conquer. And we're seeing this worldly power that is crushing everybody around it, but it doesn't last. Suddenly there's a male goat that comes racing across, and it's got this horn coming out from the front of it, and it crushes this ram. We're told later in verse 21 that the male goat is the kingdom of Greece. The large horn that is between its eyes is the first king. Well, we know from our study of history that that's Alexander the Great. But it's astonishing that this is mentioned in this book of Daniel so many years before he was even born. And for years, people scoffed at the Bible because it talked about the King Belshazzar. And the scholars all knew that there was no King Belshazzar, that the last king of, of uh, Babylon was the King Nabonidus. So they, they said, obviously, this book was written later. There's no reason why this writer wouldn't know about all these kingdoms, because he wrote about this book later. And then the Nabonidus Chronicle, or the Nabonidus tab tablet, was discovered. And from it, we learned that the king Nabonidus, when he got older, maybe he wanted to get to some better weather, I don't know, but he moved on down south to Arabia. And he set up a co-regency where he ruled in the south and his son Belshazzar ruled up in the north in Babylonia. And suddenly, the book of Daniel began to be seen in a whole new light. We come to realize that whoever wrote this book didn't write it later because Belshazzar wasn't even known later, that they must have been present in those days to actually have known that name and to have known what was going on. Wow, there's a big boost for the Bible right there. Uh, this was written about 500 years before Christ. Now, again, incredible because Greece and Alexander hadn't even come onto the scene until the mid-300s. So the fact that Alexander comes on helps to confirm that you can trust this book. You can trust what's here. You can trust that God knows the future. But it's not here just to entertain us. It's not even here just to give us confidence. Yeah, we know better than everybody else, right? Our Bible knows the future. No, it's also for our practical lives today. It tells about the first king, Alexander the Great. And it tells us that this horn came up, but it was broken right when it was at its strongest. And if you remember from history, Alexander went, conquered the known world. He went all the way to India. Then he went back to Babylonia where he died in what some believed was a drunken party from a fever. This guy was on top of the world but he was living for himself, and he just imploded. Verse 8 says, Therefore the male goat grew very great, but when he became strong, the large horn was broken, and in its place four notable ones came up toward the four winds. So now we're going again into the future, and Daniel says that it's not just going to be one ruler, that after him, instead there's going to be four generals who are given control. And it happens just like this. There are four kingdoms that rise up, four of his generals that took parts of different parts of the empire after he was gone. So then we have another kingdom coming up, which grew exceedingly great toward the south, toward the east, and toward the glorious land. We see this happening with Rome as Rome comes in. And this is a repeat as Rome conquers all of these lands in these exact directions, toward Egypt, toward the east, toward the glorious land. 
And it grew up to the host of heaven, and it cast down some of the host and some of the stars to the ground and trampled on them. Now we could guess from other prophecies what this means. However, we might get it wrong, right? So the angel tells us again a little bit later. And a king shall rise, talking about this little horn of power, having fierce features, who understands sinister schemes. This, this word sinister schemes, it could be translated as riddles. He's making things complicated. He's making things difficult. His power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. Do you know where the church began to get power in those days? It got its power from the states, and it got its power from being a state. It began to be the one that was appointing kings, and it began to rule based upon the strong arm of the state. It lost the power of self-sacrificing love, which is what the Bible's all about, right? And that's how God reigns. That's how God rules. It's the only eternal principle that will last, self-sacrificing love. It's what God's law is all about. He shall destroy fearfully and shall prosper and thrive. He shall destroy the mighty and also the holy people. So here he is making war against God. This power that is going up is now choosing to make it a religious battle. And there's something about religion that holds power over people. And this power, when you use it wrongly, you can actually control people. It does this in a most evil way by choosing to use religion to control people. He even exalted himself as high as the prince of ho the host. And the Prince of Hosts here, of course, means Jesus. So we could say he exalted himself even as high as Jesus. And by him the daily sacrifices were taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. Because of transgression, and notice why, it's because of the transgression, transgression, it's because of their neglect of the principles of God, the law of God. Because of the neglect of this, that's why their power was able to succeed. Because of the transgression, an army was given over to the horn to oppose the daily sacrifices. And he cast, next there, and he cast truth to the ground. And he did all this and prospered. So what is this truth all about? We can look at John 17, 17. It says, sanctify them or set them apart by your truth. Your word, God says, the words that I speak, that is truth. That's where we can know that we're on safe ground. Now notice what begins to happen with our Christianity that was birthed to spread the good news about Jesus through the world, right? What this church began to do was the very truth that Jesus had said. I want my church to be set apart. I want them to be sanctified by, the, by this truth. But then things began to change. Things began to change. Here, Pope Gregory VII, on January 2 of 1080, said, Not without reason has it pleased Almighty, Almighty God that the Holy Scripture should be in a secret in certain places, lost if it were plainly apparent to all men. What, what he's basically saying here is it would be dangerous for everybody to have access to the Scriptures. Perchance it would be little esteemed. People might not really respect the Word of God if they had access to it and to be subject to disrespect, or it might be falsely understood by those of mediocre learning and lead to error. So here they're using those sinister schemes that we talked about before. They're using riddles. And in a way, this could come across as, as good intentions. You know, we probably shouldn't judge uh, Pope Gregory. Uh, we don't know exactly why he was doing this, and we know that there were heresies that, that crept into the church, right? We know that there were strange translations of the Bible coming apart. And the church was concerned about this. They said, hey, we've got to hold on to our traditions. We've got to hold on to our Bible. We've got to make sure nobody puts errors into the Bible. So we're going to keep this really tightly. Peter Waldo, in the late 1100s, commissioned the very first translation of the Bible in a modern tongue outside of Latin. He, he had it translated into the Romance language, which was an ancestor of today's French. And you might know the Waldensians. He's the one that they were named after. So he got the Bible translated. And you notice all the way in the 1100s, it's finally getting translated into a language that the people can understand. 
But then comes along the Council of Toulouse. In 1229, they said, we prohibit or prohibit also that the laity shall be permitted to have the books of the Old or New Testament. We most strictly forbid their having any translation of these books. So in other words, what these Waldensians are doing, we've got to stop it. No more translating the Bible. No more making the Bible accessible to the people. Stop putting it in their languages so they can understand it. The laity, and the laity means the, the people who weren't in the church leadership, right? The laity are not able to, should not be accessing the Bible. And then the council of Tarragon in 1234 said, no one may possess the books of the Old and New Testaments in the Romance language. They're specifically targeting that language that the Waldensians were using. If anyone possesses them, he must turn them over to the local bishop within eight days after the promulgation of this decree that they may be burned. They're zealous to make sure that they're protecting what they think of as truth. And we might stand back and say, that's crazy. You know, what were they thinking? What was going on? But let's, let's think about it in our own lives. Are we maybe holding on to anything for the sake of tradition rather than looking at what the Word of God is actually about? John Wycliffe, who became known as the morning star of the Reformation, so he works on getting the Bible translated into English. And he said that translating the Bible into English will helpeth, okay, they spoke differently than we do now, huh? It was English, but it was a different English. Helpeth Christian men to study the gospel. Okay, it's a, it's a different English than we have, but at that time it was the common language. It was the language that people could understand. It will help with Christian men to study the gospel in a tongue in which they know best Christ's sentence. So in other words, the, the language that communicates the gospel to them in the words that they understand and that they use in their daily lives. Steps to Christ says very, something very similar. The Bible was not written for the scholar alone. On the contrary, it was designed for the common people. So it's for everybody to have access to. And the goal is to get it out to as many people as possible so that they can understand and grasp it. Continues. The great truths necessary for salvation are made as clear as noonday, and none will mistake and lose their way except those who follow their own judgment instead of the plainly revealed Word of God. So what's the best translation of the Bible? Um, a, there was a Greek uh, professor said, well, of course, you need to read it in Greek or Hebrew, right? Those are the languages it was written in. Uh, but that could be a problem for most of us. So then the professor continued and said, if you can't read in Greek or Hebrew, get as many translations as you can. Now, we're not talking about just simple devotional reading. That's okay. Read, read what you want for your devotion reading. But if you're really trying to study the Bible, you need to be able to try to get at what it was originally saying. So read it in as many translations as you can. And if they all agree, you're probably on pretty good ground there. But if you see something that, that's confusing, that's conflicting, then you can start to look at the, the commentaries, the books that are written by the people who are studying it in, in Greek and Hebrew, and you can look and see what, what they have to say. Another pastor said, the best translation of the Bible is the one you read. And of course, the one you understand, right? Okay, so the Bible has to be for the common people. We can choose to be like the ancient church and say, oh no, don't change the Bible. Or we can realize that having access to Bible in different languages and different translations is good for us. I challenge you, look at how the Bible, even the English Bible has changed over history. You know, the English language does, is not static. It doesn't stay the same. Every language changes. I was at the uh, Huntington Library one time and went in, they had uh, the Canterbury Tales there. And I looked at it and oh my goodness, you could, I couldn't even hardly read the um, letters, but where you could, I couldn't figure out what it was talking about. It looked more like it was German than English. I don't, I don't know what was going on. So over time, the language changes. You know, I, I left this country for five years and came back and I noticed little tiny, not huge, but little tiny changes that had happened to our, our language in just the time that I was gone. The language changes, so we need to be able to understand the best translation is the one that you can read and understand. God wants us to come into contact with Him through the Bible. Now we come to the Arundel Constitution. 
And it says that no one in the future will translate any text of Scripture into English or into any other text than book, Scripture, or tract, or that such book, Scripture, or tract be read, whether new in the time of said John Wycliffe, written or written in the future, whether in part or as a whole, public or hidden. This is under punishment of the greater excommunication. So they're writing about one specific person now. They're writing about John Wycliffe, and they're saying... He's saying, let's get the Bible translated to English. This will help the people understand in the common language that they speak, the tongue that they use every day. And the church says, no, let's keep it in a way that we can excommunicate anyone that thinks the Bible should be in English. Later, later, there, there we go. After Wycliffe had been dead for 40 years, a council met and decided that um, they would have his bones dug up and burned, and then they were thrown into the Swift River, all because he dared to ha make the Bible accessible to the people, to put it into the common language. He was messing with traditions a little too much. He was making Jesus a little too accessible to the people, and the church wouldn't have it. After Wycliffe came William Tyndale, and William Tyndall was burned at the stake for translating the Bible into English. Whew, you ever think about this, this heritage that we have, how easy it is for us to grab the Bible and read it? You think about the people and what they were willing to do to get you this book? You know, we need to think back again and get that heart of Martin Luther. Oh, let me have this book. Let us truly appreciate that it is God's love letter to us. A historian, um, J.A. Wiley, wrote that the noon of the papacy was the midnight of the world. You get the idea that, the, that the, the church at that time is shining very brightly, but the world is in tremendous darkness. And you remember what we used to call the, the medieval ages? The dark ages, <laughs> yeah. And it's when we had the plagues, we had the crusades, there were people dying of all kinds of things in those days. It was a time of great darkness, and it was darkness with the, the academics too, right? And then when things began to come back again, we call it the enlightenment, when people began to get the ability to read again and to study again. So the noon of the papacy was the midnight of the world. But more than just in the physical and mental things, it began to have to do with truth itself. Through his cunning, he shall cause deceit to prosper under his rule. Through his cunning. Do you recognize those words from anywhere else? Something that Satan has done? What if we go all the way back to the Garden of Eden? What happened? Oh, okay. Uh, he skipped a slide somewhere, but anyway, well, it's okay. We'll keep going. Um, so, back to the Garden of Eden. We'll get back to that later. Okay. So, here's a list that one pastor came up with. Things of deceit that we see prospering at that time. We see the things that the, the church did. Let's just highlight a few of these. Um, I remember, number one, hearing um, Ken talk about this in Sabbath school. Is it last week or the week before? The worship of images, right? Um, changing Number two, changing the Sabbath to Sunday. Uh, number three, praying to the saints. What's wrong with praying to the saints? Well, it's separating the people from God. You've got to pray to somebody who's more righteous than you so that you can convince God to be good to you. You've got you to gotta find an intermediary. You're not good enough to talk to God yourself. The, um, number five, the uh, unending torment of the wicked. This is the idea that somehow God is satisfied to see you writhing in pain, unending through all of the ages. Uh, number six, purgatory. That was developed basically in order to enable people to be purified. They get tortured a little while and then get sent to heaven. And you won't find that in the Bible. Uh, number seven, confession to the priest. Again, putting up a barrier between you and God. Uh, number nine, the indulgences. This was paying for money in order for you to get your loved ones out of purgatory faster. And who knows how much that will ever cost, right? Uh, number ten, papal supremacy. The idea that the uh, Pope is the one now installing kings. He's the one now in charge of all the other countries. Uh, number 11, papal infallibility. The Pope can do no wrong. So this became what Christian history was all about. And the Bible says the most intense things about a religious threat because this is the most powerful thing Satan can use is to twist theology, to twist the spiritual truth, and get the people to follow a lie. 
Through his cunning, he shall cause deceit to prosper under his rule. Notice again, we use that word cunning. Here we go back to Genesis. Okay, Genesis 3, 1. Now the serpent was more cunning than all the other creatures at that time. Notice what his lie was all about. And he said to the woman, has God indeed said? Oh. He's saying, do you really understand what God said yourself? Maybe I need to come in here and interpret it for you. Maybe I need to be able to, to let you know what God meant by what he said. You shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And that's not the only time we hear something like this. Here we go. So has God indeed said. Think about it. When Jesus came in contact with Satan, again and again, he's telling him, if you are the Son of God, if you are the Son of God, right? In Matthew chapter 3, God says, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. And now Satan comes in after this and wants to plant some doubt. If you are the Son of God, okay? But notice in verse 25 of Daniel, Daniel 8, and he shall exalt himself in his heart. There's self-exaltation going on here. He shall destroy many in their prosperity. That language sounds a whole lot like Isaiah chapter 14, which is talking about Lucifer in the context of the king of Babylon. It says, for you have said in your heart, it's something to do with the heart that we've got going on here, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the, fathers, on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. So here we've got it. I will exalt myself, he says again and again. And then notice he says, I will be like the Most High. I will ascend. I will exalt myself. He's telling us this is the way God operates. God is operating based on selfishness. He operates in a selfish way and that there is no unselfishness. Notice he's telling the same lie that he told to Adam in Genesis. He told the same lie that he was talking about. There we go. In the day that you eat the fruit, that you take that for yourself, you will be like God. If you decide to live in a selfish way, then you're going to become like God because God himself is selfish. And we bought the lie. And we're experiencing what it's like to live in selfishness. Are you sick of it? I don't know, but I am. I want God's kingdom to be established on earth here. I want to love again like Jesus loves. In the book of education, unselfishness, the principle of God's kingdom. What is the principle of God's kingdom? Unselfishness, yeah. Okay. So we need everybody to get this. Unselfishness, the principle of God's kingdom. It's the principle that Satan hates and it's the very existence he denies. And I love it how God brings everything together because I think I heard Pastor Doug talking about the same thing in the Sabbath school lesson today and I heard Aaron talk about it in his story about India today. Unselfishness, that's what it's all about, huh? All right, continuing in the book of education. From the beginning of the great controversy, he has endeavored to prove God's principles of actions to be selfish, and he deals in the same way with all who serve God. He wants you to appear selfish. He wants our worship service to appear selfish. He wants our church budget to look selfish. He's okay if we just sit back in the pews and think about our salvation, because then we're acting only for ourselves, for selfishness, right? What God wants is for us to be filled with unselfish, self-sacrificing love. He shall even rise against the prince of princes. Princes. There you see again, he's trying to take Christ's place. And notice what he tried to do on earth when he was tempting Jesus. Not only did he tell him, if you're the son of God, planning doubt about God's word, but he said, all these things I will give you if you fall down and worship me. He wants to take Jesus' place. He wants for his principles to be what we follow rather than the principles of the kingdom of heaven. He shall even arise against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken. What does the last line say? 
without human means. Does this sound familiar? Remember in Daniel chapter 2, the rock that was cut out without hand? It's emphasized again and again, without his hands, without hands. This is something different. It's something that only God can do. It's God's principles. He's going to be broken without human means. There's good news about all the deceit that is prospering on this planet. It will come to an end through God's self-sacrificing love. Truth will prevail in the end, and he wants for you and I to be, begin to let it prevail in our hearts today. Jesus reveals what it's like in his battle with Satan again and again. He refuses to just battle him on logical or philosophical arguments, but instead he says, it is written, it is written, it is written. This is what the Bible says. That was his answer to Satan every time. Notice back in Daniel chapter 7, we see it is until the court was seated, and what does it say? Well, the books were opened, yeah. The books were opened. So do you see God fights battles with books? Isn't that something, huh? God defi defeats all these ferocious beasts that are trampling and devouring the planet, and God solves the problems of history with truth. He will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. It is the truth that will prevail in the end. It is the Word of God on which we stand. The court was seated, and the books were opened. So you see how God is fighting the battle. And we can see this again in, in Revelation when he comes back riding on a white horse and what's coming out of Jesus' mouth? The sword, the sword of the Spirit. He comes back with his word. Let's keep going. Notice that this is the judgment scene in D Daniel chapter 7. We learn that the Father has given all judgment to the Son. So we can be excited. It's the Son who's the, the, the judge of man, right? And he judges in our favor when he wants to give you the throne. That's incredible. Jesus wants you to sit on the throne of the universe with him through eternity. Isn't that amazing? Now let's look at this. If anyone hears my words and does not believe, I do not judge him. Wait, who's the judge? The Father says, I have all the authority, but I'm giving it to Jesus. And then Jesus says, well, I'm not going to judge. And you say, well, hold on. Why not Jesus? Well, let's let Jesus answer for himself. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. You want to represent Christ? Share this message with the world. He didn't come to judge the world. He didn't come to condemn the world. If our witness is to condemn people, if our witness is to judge people, we are not representing Christ. In fact, we're representing the Antichrist. For I did not come to judge this world, but to save the world. He who rejects me and does not receive my word has that which judges him. All the judgment that's needed is the principles of his kingdom, and they will be seen as worthy. And even those who are lost in the end will recognize it, and they'll fall on their faces and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, as Philippians 2 tells us. The word that I have spoken will judge him in that last day. He's not even going to have to say anything. He's already said enough. He's given us the word of God that he's revealed to us. I didn't come to judge you. I came to save you. Do you want to be a part of my kingdom? I've got a seat for you right here on my father's throne. I overcame and I'm sitting here. I'd like you to come and be a part of this kingdom throughout eternity. Do you want in? I'm standing at the door knocking. Just open the door. Take time every day to get to know the word, the living word. You know, we can have the word, but still not truly have Jesus. For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me gave me a command, what I should say and what I should speak. What is God's word all about? Jesus, right? He gave me the command of what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his command is everlasting life. God's will is that you will not perish, that no person out there would perish, that every person on this planet would have everlasting life. That is his relentless pursuit. He's chasing us right now, right down today. He wants every one of us with him. The words that I speak to you, Jesus said in John 6, 36, are spirit and they are life. God's word gives us life. 
In Deuteronomy 32, 47, Moses said the same thing. They are not just idle words for you. They are your life. By them you will live long in the land. Oh boy, do you want to live like Martin Luther? Do you want a heart like Martin Luther's? Give me that book. Get it into my heart. Get it into my mind. I've got to know this God because he didn't come to judge me. He came to save. He's on my side and his eternal principles are true. They'll over overcome every worldly authority, every kingdom, every way that people have exercised authority throughout history. That's what the book of Daniel is all about. In contrast, there's the way the world operates and the way Jesus operates. And Jesus operates by stepping down in self-sacrifice, by washing our feet, right? Even all the way to laying down his life for us. The book of education says the only, that, only that which is bound up with his purpose and expresses his character can endure. It's about the character of God, and it's about expressing that character. That is the only principle that will endure. His principles are the only steadfast thing the world knows. You can count on it. In the end, there's just going to be love. That will be what will win in the end. One day there will be a universe where everything from the smallest atom to the largest whatever's out there will all pulsate, will beat with God's love. But here's the thing about God's love. Again, we can read it and not actually come into contact with that love. In, in John, Jesus is talking about the religious leaders. He says, you search the scriptures. And we can think about those in the medieval days who were in authority. They knew the Bible. They knew what was going on. They were very concerned about those translators. They were concerned about the people taking the, the Bible out of Latin. They didn't want the people to have access. You search the scriptures for you in them. You think that you have eternal life. So we can't stop at just knowing the words. That's not enough. Jesus says, these are they which testify to me. And yet you would not come to me that you might have life. You decided you knew the scriptures so well that you're now rejecting how I operate and how the kingdom that I came to set up operates. Where I said, blessed are the poor in spirit. The meek will inherit the kingdom. Love your enemy. Do good to those who persecute you. Pray for those who are treating you badly. They didn't want that. That, that wasn't the kind of kingdom they wanted. They wanted a kingdom like all the other kingdoms in the world that had the power and the power of God behind them. That was what the little horn in Daniel was all about. But I hope we want a different kingdom, right? We want to come to Jesus. How do we know when we come to Jesus? When we come in the morning, or maybe we're busy and we've got to come at different times throughout the day, but when we come and we, we get those moments and those times in the Bible to spend and to pray and we ask God to give us that desire like Martin Luther. Now you can read some of the stories in the Bible and say, well, wait a minute, is this going to make you fall in love with God? Maybe not. Maybe some of them, maybe not. So, you know, you might be thinking, what's going on? So here, we're going to talk about a, a key that just may help you to, to understand what this is all about. The book of education says, the Bible is its own expositor. That means it explains itself. Scripture is to be cared, compared with Scripture, and the student should learn to view the world as a whole and to see the relation of the parts. We've got to realize it's not just a theological textbook. It isn't just a list of rules and regulation regulations. This is the story from Genesis to Revelation, and the whole thing, we've got to see it all as one, as a whole story. He should gain the knowledge of its grand central theme. So when you're reading the Bible, you've got to look for that theme. You've got to look for that purpose. What was God's purpose for creating the world? He created a good planet for his creatures that he loves to live in. Of the rise of the great controversy and of the work of redemption, there it is. It's all about the saving grace of Jesus Christ. So when you're reading a text, any text in the Bible, that's what you've got to be looking for. He should understand the nature of the two principles that are contending for supremacy. What is the principle of God? Unselfishness. We saw it in heaven. We saw it in the Garden of Eden. We see it in Daniel 8. The two principles that are waging war. Selfishness and unselfishness. Righteousness and sin. Love and selfishness. The law of God and lawlessness. Law lawlessness. He should understand the nature of the two principles that are contending for supremacy and should learn to trace their working through the records of history and prophecy and to the great consummation. So I don't know about you, what you thought prophecy was all about, but we probably think it's about a whole lot, but that's it. There's those two things, right? The two principles that are waging war on this planet. Selfishness and unselfishness. 
Self-sacrificing love is what the Bible is all about. And if you miss that, you miss Jesus, whose name actually means Yahweh saves. It's this relentless pursuit of God chasing after human beings. He wants to have a relationship with each one of us through all of history. He should see how the controversy enters into every phase of human experience. Now, when you read the headlines today, when you see what's going on, maybe in your own neighborhood, you see these two principles going on, right? Selfishness and unselfishness. And then begin to look in your own heart. How in every act of life, he himself reveals the one or the other of the two antagonistic motives. And how, whether he will or will not, is even now deciding upon the side of the controversy, he will be found. So this mark is calling for us to be sealed. Every choice that we're making, we're choosing to love people with unselfish love, choosing to serve them and make them first in our life, or we're choosing self-preservation. We can take on the religious garb, just like they did in the, in the dark ages, and be lost, or we can take on the self-sacrificing love where we serve until the very end just like Jesus, take up his cross and follow after him. Two principles, selfishness versus unselfishness. We can always see when somebody's reading the Bible for themselves, and they're just pouring through it, and they keep reading and reading. They can't even put down the Bible. Have you experienced that? On the other hand, you can also see people who get excited for a little while and really get into things, and then the excitement begins to wane and um, disappear. And I've, I've been through it many times, probably some of you, most of you have too. So we need to keep coming into contact with that love of God every day. Again, it comes down to the two principles, selfishness or unselfishness. We've got to come in contact with the Word, recognizing that it reveals Jesus. All right, to finish up, we're not too late, huh? All right, so back to Martin Luther. So there he was. He said, give me the Word of God. Martin Luther later went on and became a monk. And as a monk in his convent, he would constantly go to the wall in the monastery because there was that Bible chained to the wall. And he would read and pour through that book. And as he read it and read it, he was whipping himself and fasting until he would nearly die. He was trying to find God's favor somehow. Well, we all need people to help instruct us. And he had a teacher who came along and began to show him through the Bible the grace and the mercy and the love of God. He went on a pilgrimage to Rome. And it's in Rome where he was at what, what's called Pilate's Staircase. And he was on his knees. And on every step you crawl up on your knees, you say a prayer. And that, that helps you to gain favor with God when suddenly the Word of God popped back into his mind. The just shall live by faith. And he got up off his knees and never went back. He began living by God's faith, by God's loving character, and he began to display this to the world. There in the 95 Thesis, he nailed to the church in Wittenberg, exposing some of these things that we've been talking about today, of what Christianity had become. He's talking about his own church at the time, so he's not pointing at somebody else. He's talking about his own church as a leader in that church. Well, this got him in a lot of trouble. And we fast forward to the Diet of Worms, what you see the picture here. Now, at the Diet of Worms, he was called to defend his writings and defend his teachings. And he's there for several days. He's trying to explain to him, and suddenly the spokesman asks, you have not answered the question put to you. You are required to give a clear and precise answer. He's just bottom line. Martin Luther, will you or will you not retract? And what you answer will probably determine if you're going to live or not. Because if you answer wrong, you're probably going to burn at the stake like the other martyrs like Tyndale. Well, this was his response. Since you and your most serene majesty and your most high mightiness require from me a clear and simple and precise answer, I will give you one, and it is this. I cannot submit my faith to either the Pope or to the councils because it is clear as day that they have frequently erred and contradicted each other. Unless, therefore, I am convinced by the testimony of Scripture, and this became the, one of the key phrases, right? Sola Scripture, that was what the Reformation was based on, the Bible and the Bible alone. I cannot and will not retract, for it is unsafe for a Christian to speak against his conscious, conscience. Here I stand. I can do no other. May God help me. He stood against the tradition that was holding the gospel back from the people. He stood against this massive system that was misrepresenting what God is all about. God is crazy about having a relationship with people like you and me. It's kind of a wild thought, huh? And Martha, Martin Luther wanted the people to know that he was willing to die to get that idea out there. 
God, give me this book. It's my desire that we all have a greater hunger and thirst to get to know and love God as he was revealed in the, books of, uh, in the pages of his book. Today I want to invite you to take a stand with me. Stand with Martin Luther and say you're going to stand on the Bible. you are stand on Scripture. You'll stand on the Word of God. You want to live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Let's pray. Our God, we want to have open hearts to these words. We want to know your heart of love. They're principles that are eternal in nature and one day will conquer all evil, all, all this self-sacrificing will become our way of life, we pray. Give us the, the passion for the Bible. Give us a passion for Jesus. Give us a friendship with you who would do anything for us. Thank you, God. And we want to thank you for all of those who went before and, and all the sacrifices, even their own lives that they made to give us the Bible. And you know, God, we've neglected it. I know I have. We left it there on the shelf sometimes, left, let it get dusty. Jesus, give us a new heart and a new desire that we will seek after it and we will seek after your truth and your self-sacrificing love. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.